Yeah, yeah Ryan. Um, today we're continuing our series, kind of looking at the Old Testament books, um, and um, and we're looking at them to really see really how Christ is revealed throughout all these books, and also the kingdom of God. Um, and it's kind of an amazing thing if you think about it, really, um, because this is how God works. If you always want to wonder how does God work, it's always through His Word. And that's actually why we're looking at these, these books, all from the Old Testament, uh, because he's working through his word. He makes these prophecies, these promises, and then he fulfills them, because he's a God of the covenant, he's a God of promises. And that's actually why we can trust in God's word today. I mean, when you read this Bible and you read these passages about your salvation in Christ, your identity as a child of God, your authority over the force of darkness, um, one of the reasons that we can trust in that word is because God is faithful. And we have evidence. Because all of his promises from the Old Testament, they are fulfilled. His word is always fulfilled. And that is how he works. And that's how we can trust and believe in it today. You know, kingdoms come and go. Um, and politicians too. Um, there's a lot of arguing and stuff going on about you know politicians in America, here in Korea, in different parts of the world. Um, but politicians, they come and go. The thing that stands forever is the Word of God. The Word of God is the thing that stands forever. And that's why the truth of salvation, it's only found in Christ. It's found in the Gospel, found in the Bible, and that's why God's Word is our guiding light. The politician isn't your guiding light. That ruler or leader is not your guiding light. It's God's Word, and that's why it's important that we spend time looking at God's Word. Um, so that's why, as we go through Zechariah today, I really pray that you kind of see the evidence of how God actually prophesies and shows His Word and how these things are actually fulfilled. And how the answer for this world that He shares through that Word is always going to be Christ. That's why it was a mystery from long ages past, now revealed to us. Um, so we're looking at the book of Zechariah. Um, how many of you guys have read the book of Zechariah? <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, and that's why we're going through it today. <laughs> uh, because, honestly, how much time do we spend looking at these Old Testament books? You know, I bet you guys know Acts, the book of Acts, really well. Um, and maybe the Gospels and the Epistles of, of Paul and, you know, the New Testament. And maybe the first five books of the Bible. Well, what about these other books? Like Zechariah and Micah and these kind of obscure books of different minor prophets and major prophets. We really don't spend any time in them. And that's why we're actually doing this whole series of looking at these books and showing, wow, these are relevant today because God is always sharing the same kind of path. You know, hold on to his covenant. And his covenant is always found in Christ and pointing towards the kingdom of God coming. So we're looking at Zechariah. This book was written in 520 BC. It's about 500 years before Christ came. Um, and honestly, as I was reading through this book, it was actually one of my last first times actually going through it in detail. Um, it is very confusing. <laughs> um, and if you look at scholars and, and commenters about it, they say it is very confusing and it actually lacks unity in many parts. Um, so it's very difficult to go through. Um, and it's roughly broken down into two parts. The first part of the book um, starts with a call to repentance. And then it's followed by a series of eight dreams, eight dreams and visions um, that deal mainly with kind of future events. Um, and these dreams are kind of reminiscent of kind of Ezekiel and his dreams, or maybe Isaiah, his visions of heaven. Um, but these are, these are very confusing. Um, and in a very where he talks about like four horsemen, four horns, four blacksmiths, this woman in a basket, this guy with a measuring line, they're really kind of um, weird visions and things. That's, it's really hard to understand, um, unless you have like a commentary or something to kind of help guide you. Um, but that's kind of the first half of the book. It's looking at these eight dreams. And then the second half um, is also looking at basically prophecies towards the Messiah and the coming kingdom of God. Looking towards the future judgment and salvation um, that's going to come to the people. So it's also a book of hope and encouragement. And this book is written um, in the same time period that we've been going through, um, the same as last time um, for the book of Haggai. Um, it's the time of the restoration of the Jews. And they, they were taken as captives, they were in Babylon um, as captives for a period of time, 70 years. 
and they're starting to come back. And this is the first group coming back, about 50,000, um, came back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Um, and they returned with two main figures. Now, these two main figures are important for this book. Um, it's Zerubbabel, is the first one, and he's a political figure. He's kind of, kind of, kind of like the governor or the ruler of the area. Um, he is also in the line of David, though, as well. So he's kind of like a king in a way. Um, he's the ruler that's taking them back. But then the other leader of the group is Joshua. And Joshua is a priest. He is their, their religious leader or their spiritual leader. Um, this book that was written by Zechariah, um, he's kind of like a couple other prophets, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, he wasn't just a prophet, but he himself was a priest as well. Uh, Zechariah, the writer of this book, he's from the, the Levi clan, um, the family priestly clan. Um, so he was a priest prophet. He was born in captivity in Babylon, and he's coming back under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua. And so he's kind of a young man, actually, at the time he's coming back. Um, Zechariah, his name means the Lord remembers. So Zechariah, it means the Lord remembers. And this is kind of reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, our God, he's a God of the covenant. He's faithful. He fulfills his promises. And for them coming back, they kind of might have felt like, you know, maybe God forgot about us. You know, they were completely destroyed because of their idol worship. They were taken as captives. And they could be like, you know, where were you, God? What's going on? Did you forget about us? You know, why aren't you fulfilling your covenant like you said? And so this reflects upon the name of Zechariah. The Lord remembers. He remembers. He does care. And he's bringing them this message through this book and through Zechariah's word, through God's word, to instill them that he does remember. He does love them. He is a personal God, a God of the covenant. And he will take action to fulfill his promises. And that's something we need to remember today as well. You know, God fulfills his promises. Um, but looking at this book, once again, it's, it's very complicated. It's not linear. It doesn't follow a very good order, um, like a normal timeline, because of all the imagery and dreams. Um, I encourage you to try reading through it and, and try to experience that. Um, but we're going to kind of dig through it and kind of look at um, what's going on. The message that Zechariah is giving, it's for the people as they're building the temple the temple that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They're sent back and they start to build it again. Um, and he's addressing the problems that they're going through. But the book is filled with, with prophecies and types of Christ and the kingdom of God as well. So let's start by looking at the problem kind of of this age. And we kind of have gone through it in a couple of other messages. But this age that they're at, they came back from Babylon and the thing that's really entering into them a lot is it's religious, religious, yeah, I can't even say the word, basically a religious lifestyle. Um, it's kind of a religious stubbornness um, where they're really just going through actions. They don't really have a heart towards God. Um, but they're so used to these feasts, these ceremonies, that they're just going through the actions. Just like someone coming to church because they feel like you should go to church. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, and they also are caught in the pride of this chosen people mentality. <coughs> so they're really against any foreigners, any Gentiles, uh, anyone that's not Jews. Um, even building up walls to keep out the foreigners. And can we see this depicted in this book in chapter 7? Um, it says, God is actually speaking to them. He says, when you fasted and mourned, for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? When you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? So he's pointing out their, their, their ceremonies, their celebrations, they were kind of like parties. They were just going through the actions. They didn't have a heart for God. It's just having fun. A lot of people come to church, right? Just to have fun, to meet people, to hang out, you know, eat free pizza and stuff like that. Um, that's not what church is. Of course, that's good to have fellowship. That's important. 
Um, but this is where they got lost. They got lost in just the ceremonies and just the actions. And God says to them, administer true justice, show mercy, compassion. Don't oppress the widows and the fatherless, the alien, the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. And this is kind of where their hearts were. It was sort of selfishness. It was all about them, and they thought that everyone else was the enemy. It says they refused to pay attention. They stubbornly turned their backs and stopped their ears. God says, when I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen to them. Because they were no longer looking to God, they were just going through these actions to the good of others. Kind of going through this, this thing for show. And so they entered into this religious nature and kind of what made matters worse is it was all about themselves. It was all prone towards selfishness. Um, they didn't even see the foreigners and the other people that wanted to meet God. Um, they saw the other nations as unclean, as having no relation to God. And because of this kind of heart that they had, this mindset, um, God shares them this message. And that's the first one we're going to look at. Um, God is sharing with them a vision of the true kingdom of Christ. Not the one that they have kind of in their traditions or the one that they've selfishly come to believe, but the true kingdom of God. What should it look like? And he's also pointing to Christ. So the first one we're going to look at is the revelation of the kingdom of God. And this is actually where we get the title for today. Um, the kingdom of God and a city without walls. Um, in Zechariah, the way it starts, the first part, he has these eight dreams. Um, like I said, they're very confusing. And they talk about the future. Um, they talk about four horsemen riding throughout the world on behalf of God. This is followed by four horns that arise. And four blacksmiths that come out and destroy those. And this is basically symbolizing the rise and fall of these great empires. Um, four different empires that will rise and fall. But throughout these, God is also revealing the kingdom of God. And so let's look at the first one. It's in Zechariah 2. In Zechariah 2, there is um, this vision he has of a man with a measuring line. Uh, this man with the measuring line is basically a string. He's going and he's measuring different parts of the city. And as he's doing that, at one point he says something remarkable. He says, run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls. Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within I think this is very cool. You know, Jerusalem is going to be a city without walls. Why? Because of the great number of people in it. In the kingdom of God, this is pointed to the vastness, the inclusion of so many people, all the nations, in the kingdom of God. And if you study theology, um, there's something we kind of learn about. Um, there's two different types of churches. There's the visible church, you know, that we see with our eyes, like, the building, the church building we have, you know, here and there, and the people that attend the church, the individuals. But the physical church, that's not the true church. The true church is invisible. You can't see the true church with your eyes because we have physical eyes. We only see people and them coming and going to church. The true church, the invisible church, is those that are born again. Those that have God's spirit in them. And honestly, when you come to church, you can't see who those people are. For sure. But it's for those that have God's Spirit. That is the true church. And that is the church that they're talking about here. It's not about physically keeping people in and out. You can't do that with the true church. Because the people that are born again, it's an invisible thing. It's those that are born again. And this church expands the entire world. All nations. And each member, they're protected by God. The Spirit of God dwells in each person. We are a temple, and God's Spirit comes to dwell in us. This fire that it's talking about, this fire that surrounds the wall of the city, and that is basically the judgment fire of the Holy Spirit. We're able to pass through that fire because 
or the righteousness of Christ. We are refined by it, made clean. It's all through Christ and what he did. And so it's for only those that have God's spirit. The problem is, what do the Israelites do? They're building a wall. <laughs> They're building a physical wall to keep out the other nations. That's why in Zechariah 2.10 he says, Shout and be glad, for I am coming and I will live among you. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will be among you and you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. It says many nations will be joined. You know, this is amazing because if you look at the context of who they are and what they're doing, this goes against everything they believe. You know, for so long they had this belief that the kingdom of God is reserved for the Jews and the Jews alone. And if that was true, if that is still true today, you know, we would be screwed. You know, we'd be out of luck. There's no reason for us to come here today. But that's their faith. They believed it was for the Jews, the Jews alone. And what does God show Zechariah? The truth. The true kingdom of God, it has no walls. The true kingdom of God is a city of God with no walls. It's not reserved for the Jews alone, but for all nations, for all peoples. And that's why God is going to come to be with us. God coming to be with us is Christ. And then His Spirit is sent with us to be with us forever, wherever we are. So God, when He's revealing these things to these people, it's, it's many conflicting things, conflicting ideologies with what they have, their traditional held beliefs. And honestly, if you look at it, it's because of religion has really entered into their lives. They had lost hold of the gospel. Now, even the promise to Abraham, it will be a blessing to all nations. You know, they lost hold of these things. They lost hold of the gospel and evangelism, and they no longer had a heart for God. They had just become selfish and very inclusive, which is a danger for many churches of just thinking about yourself, thinking about your problems, your issues, or maybe even your pride and your identity. So God reveals the true kingdom of God for all nations. And the second point I want to go to uh, today is, that's the kingdom of God, but now how is Christ revealed in this book? Uh, because that's kind of the point of going through this series. How is Christ revealed in this book? Um, and the first way he's represented is through a type of Christ, through these anointed ones. And those are the leaders of Jerusalem. Um, the two leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua. So this is kind of symbolic. Uh, so this too is a very confusing thing. But if you look at Zechariah 4, uh, it shows out the types of Christ here. Um, Zechariah, he has this vision. It's a vision of a golden lampstand. A golden lampstand with two olive trees beside it. He says in Zechariah 4.1, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top, seven lights on it, with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on the left. So if that's confusing for you, um, it was also confusing for Zechariah. And that's why he says, what are these? So the angel replies, you know, the lampstand is the eyes of the Lord which ranges throughout the earth. God is all-knowing, He's sovereign, and He has anointed these two servants, the two olive trees that are growing beside it. And these two olive trees, they represent the two anointed with oil, with the Spirit of God, to serve the Lord of all the earth, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel, because he is of the royal line of David, he is the Messiah King. You know, he has the authority, the power. And then Joshua, he's anointed as a true priest, representing the Messiah priest, the high priest that would one day come and bring that perfect sacrifice for our salvation. And these two olive trees, they are represented, these two anointed ones. So let's look at the first one, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, he is kind of representing the king. And he's going to carry out the work of restoring the temple, restoring the kingdom of God. 
It says, this is the, the verse that we read today, Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So how will the kingdom of God come on earth? How will the kingdom of God come on earth? You know, many people think the kingdom of God will come through force, through conquering different nations. You know, that's what the Jews were always looking for, the conquering King Messiah that would come and give us a nation that would destroy all of our enemies. But this here it says, not by might, not by power. How? By the Spirit of God. You know, politicians and these great governments, they cannot bring the kingdom of God here. You know, com communism. Communism is an effort to try to bring the kingdom of God on earth. It's atheist in its background. Of course, they don't believe in any God. But communism, the whole goal is to bring heaven here on earth, to make equality for all mankind. But the problem is, it fails. Because it doesn't account for one thing. Communism is very idealistic, but in the end, it doesn't account for the sin of mankind. The sin that we all have, the sin our leaders even have. And that's how they end up becoming corrupt, and that's how things break down. But how will the kingdom of God come? It says, only by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God can save, the Spirit of God can transform you, and it can bring peace to your hearts. The God, God's Spirit can lead us ultimately to love one another uh, with a sincere love, a love that transcends all boundaries. And when it comes to the sovereignty of God, no authority, no power can stop Him. Not in heaven, or on earth. You know, God's kingdom is coming to this earth. He is all powerful, and Christ is the agent through which it comes. Christ working through the Holy Spirit. That's why in chapter 4, verse 7, it says, What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a level ground. Then he will bring out a capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple and his hands will also complete it. Then you will then know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. So what are you, mighty mountain, in front of Zerubbabel? He's saying there's no power that can stop this kingdom of God coming. Zerubbabel is going to start it, and he will complete it. So if you compare it to Zerubbabel and Christ, Zerubbabel, he laid the foundation for the temple. Christ lays the foundation for the kingdom of God coming. Who completes the work of the temple? Zerubbabel. Who is going to ultimately bring completion to the kingdom of God here on earth? Christ, on his return. And that's why we kind of live in this time period called already not yet. You know, God's kingdom is coming here. It's being established, but it's not complete. So now, Zerubbabel, he's kind of the authority for the, the kingdom of God coming to earth. The authority of a king. What does Joshua represent then? Joshua represents the role of the priest that brings salvation to people. So it says in chapter 3, verse 1, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan, standing right beside him, to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now, who is our accuser? It's Satan. Satan is the accuser. And Satan is accusing us before the throne of God. He's accusing Joshua before the throne of God. But God is the judge. And Satan is trying to accuse us, pointing out our sins to the point penalty of death and hell. But who rebukes Satan himself? It's the Lord. Who justifies us? It's Christ. So this is kind of showing, you know, what we go through. You know, when we go to heaven, of course, or in your daily life, who accuses you of sin? It's going to be Satan. Who causes you to feel guilt? Satan. Why do you feel that condemned state? Satan. His role is to accuse you and point out your sin. You deserve to go to hell. You deserve death. But who justifies? 
is God. Through Christ. So after this accusation, there's this amazing imagery of really how Christ's righteousness is applied to us. It's a beautiful picture. Um, it's in chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look at this. Um, but I think this is cool. Chapter 3, uh, verse 3. It says, Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. The angel said to him, Take off his filthy clothes. See, I have taken away your sin. And I will put a rich garment on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So what does this mean? God has taken away our sin. It's kind of like a filthy garment that we wear. God has taken away our sin. And this rich garment that's placed on us instead is the righteousness of Christ. It's not our righteousness. It's not something we work for. But we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's why we say we're imputed with Christ's righteousness. It's not our work. It's not our effort. It's God simply justifying us and His righteousness is placed on us. And the turban, it represents His reinstatement as a priest. His identity and authority that's given to Him as a priest. And this is kind of relevant to us too as priests. Because as saved individuals, God calls us priests. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, how many of you feel like priests, though? <laughs> you know, you're priests, honestly. You're saints. You are bearers of Christ. You're a holy nation. It says, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we're ambassadors of Christ. At the conclusion of this dream, God explains kind of how all these things are possible. In chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Listen, you know, the high priest Joshua and his associates, these are symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. And it's with a capital B, branch. The branch. Which is pointing to the future Christ. It says, I am going to bring my servant the branch. See, the stone I have set in front of Joshua, and I will engrave an inscription on it, and I will remove the sin of this land on a single day. In a single day, God would remove sin from this land through the branch through the Christ, who would be this perfect sacrifice for sin. In chapter 6, verse 11, he says, Take silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest Joshua. Tell him, this is what the Lord says, Here is the man whose name is the branch. And he will branch out from here and build the temple of the Lord. He will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne. When they're referring to Joshua here as being crowned, you know, with this crown, um, but also calling him the branch, it's actually not talking about Joshua himself. But it's actually talking about Christ, the branch. And this is cool if you think about how they describe the kingdom of God. It says, um, his name is Branch, right? And he will branch out from here. You know, that's how branches work, right? If you look at a branch, it has different branches that branch off of maybe a, a main limb, right? It has all these different branches that branch out from here. It says, and he will branch out from here and build the temple of the Lord. Okay, so imagine kind of the kingdom of God like this. The true branch, the limb that we're all in, is Christ. And we all kind of branch out from there, and as we share the kingdom of God, more people are grafted into that branch. But he's saying, the branching out too, ultimately, to become the kingdom of God. That's what the temple is. It's the kingdom of God. You know, I think it's beautiful imagery because, you know, this represents the kingdom of God so well. Branching out to the kingdom of God. And this is actually what Jesus refers to, in a way. 
in, in John 15. John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, and you will bear fruit. Christ is the main vine, the branch. And in Christ, we bear fruit. There are other disciples that come. There are others that are saved. And as it branches out, you get this beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. It's like a garden, or like a tree. This is the picture of the kingdom of God. It says, He will be clothed with majesty and will sit on His throne, and He will be a priest on His throne. So Jesus Christ, through these two men, we see, we're looking at the anointed ones, right? Zerubbabel, the king. Joshua, the priest. But coming together, we have the king and priest, which is Christ. So that's kind of like a type of Christ that's revealed in this book. Now let's look at the prophecies of Christ. And this is where God's word is, is fulfilled, actually. So remember, this is 500 years before Jesus came. 500 years before Jesus came. It says um, in chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, shout, see, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gently and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. This is the king, the savior, bringing salvation. Is he riding on a giant stallion in all of his glory and all of his pride? No, this rejects that kind of view. And this is the king, he's coming lowly, riding on a donkey, and going against those traditions. And this word is perfectly fulfilled when Christ comes and he enters Jerusalem. In John chapter 12, verses 13 to 15, it says, they took, sorry, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Finding a young donkey, Jesus sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on the colt of a donkey. 500 years before Christ came, this description of a savior was perfectly fulfilled in Christ. In Zechariah 9.10 it says, He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of my blood, of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Through the blood covenant, we are set free from hell, the waterless pit. So this is the Savior bringing peace. The second way there's a prophecy of Jesus is as the shepherd, the good shepherd. In chapter 9, verse 16, the Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people because they are sheep that have gone astray. In chapter 10, verse 2, the idols speak deceit. Diviners see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. You know, this is the type of people that are kind of leading us today. There are a lot of, you know, people that are caught up in sorcery, fortune-telling, idolatry, it's the same problem that they had that day. Idols that speak deceit, diviners that tell lies, false dreams. And it's all to comfort people in vain. And that's why the people, it says the people, they wander around as oppressed sheep because they lack a shepherd. That's the state of this world. They wander. Sheep that are oppressed because they don't have a shepherd. And that's why the Lord Almighty will care for his flock. From Judah will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, from every rule. Christ will rise out of Judah. In Matthew 21, it says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You know, this is Christ it's pointing to, once again. It says in chapter 10, verse 6, Christ will gather and redeem them. It says, I will restore them because I have compassion on them. I will signal for them and gather them. I will redeem them. Even though they're scattered people, they will remember me. I will strengthen them. In the Lord and in his name, they will walk. 
the final way Christ is kind of pictured here in Zechariah, the prophesied, uh, is in chapter 12, verse 10. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. On that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great. Chapter 13, verse 1. On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So we see this prophecy of how Christ would die 500 years before he died. The one they have pierced. This is Christ's death on the cross. He was also pierced with the spear in the side. But through his death on the cross, it says, on that day a fountain is opened to cleanse from sin and impurity. That's why we have salvation in Christ. Um, so in conclusion, you know, looking at this once again, this book, um, really what is a city without walls? It means the way has been opened. It means our sin is no longer a barrier to be God because Christ made the way, the anointed one. Um, and if you kind of look overall at this book once again, you'll see all of the offices of Christ here. You see the king, Zerubbabel, um, who's completing the task of the kingdom of God there. You see the priest, Joshua. Um, and we saw the example of how he's made righteous through the power of God. But also the prophet, Zechariah himself. He is the prophet that shares the word of God, bringing hope to them with the promise of Christ and the kingdom of God. So we see in this book, we, also, we have the king, the priest, and the prophet, all the offices of Christ, the anointed ones, all here. And this whole book, though it's very confusing and full of imagery, it's all pointing towards Christ. Um, you know, this book is showing the kingdom of God. Once again, the city without walls. This is pointing to missions, evangelism. Um, something that a lot of churches have lost hold of. You know, if you reflect on you know, the churches of today, a lot of people and a lot of churches, they're always inclusive, always just looking at themselves. Um, and of course, people need healing, and that's important. Um, but we can never forget that the church isn't meant to be something where we build a wall around us, where we try to keep you know, God's word away from other people, where we try to protect our children and protect ourselves from the secular society and secular world. You know, your role as a part of the royal priesthood, as a prophet, as a king, you know, is to take that authority that you have, your identity as a child of God, um, of having Christ with you, and go out to the world to live in it, to break those barriers down, and to proclaim Christ, to proclaim the gospel. And that is us, you know, branching out, sharing the kingdom of God. That is us breaking down those walls and establishing the kingdom of God throughout the world. So I want you guys to keep that in mind. And I also want you to keep in mind also that all of these things that we went through, all these prophecies, even though it might have been kind of boring or it might have been kind of confusing, um, it's important because this was 500 years before Christ and all of these things, all of God's word was fulfilled. You know, there's, I think there's about 363 prophecies specifically for Christ that were all fulfilled in his coming. And just the odds of him fulfilling um, just a few of those prophecies is like unimaginable. But he fulfills so many prophecies from the Old Testament when he came. And that's an evidence that God's word is trustworthy, that's believable. So I just want to close with this. You know, Zechariah, he goes through the covenant, the promises, um, and he ends with a future hope. And it's the same first year, future hope that we have as well. Um, and that is that one day Christ will return. And when Christ returns, we're going to see heaven 
here on earth. And so Zechariah 14 is looking at the future kingdom of God. In 14 verse 3 it says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. Living water. The Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name. The survivors from all the nations will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, the other name for that feast is the Feast of Ingathering. Um, and if you were here for first message, you know, the Feast of Ingathering is pointing to heaven. You know, the gathering of all the nations. The ingathering of all the nations. And that's this last, this last verse in chapter 14, verse 16. The survivors from all the nations will go up year after year to worship the king and to celebrate this feast. The feast of ingathering. So if you look at it, we have the Passover represents Christ's death on the cross, our salvation. We have the Pentecost, is when the Holy Spirit came. And it's starting to establish the kingdom of God. Those two things happened, right? What is the last feast that hasn't been fulfilled? It's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering. That's actually what we're looking forward to. The Feast of Ingathering is in the timeline going to be fulfilled when the kingdom of God comes to the earth and all nations are gathered. And that's the city without walls. That's the kingdom of God. So I just pray um, that you hold on to uh, God's word. And especially let's close with this last verse, Zechariah 4, 6, the one we read. This is the word of the Lord to his rupa bell. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Let's pray as we hold on to today's message.